Here now is Faith to Live By with Pastor Barber. In John chapter 16, verse 33, as Jesus is just about to go to the cross, he says to his disciples, these things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage, I have overcome the world. Here is the male quartet to sing God on the Mountain. The Bible has the answer. You have provided the questions and we search the scriptures, God's holy word, in order to find the answers. Question number one, what is baptism? At its simplest form, baptism is a picture of Christ's work and our identification with him. I take you to Romans chapter six, verses three to six, where the apostle Paul says, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Baptism is a picture of a believer who comes 
to be buried as Christ was buried, but then raised up to live a new life. And also, most importantly, to identify with Christ. In the ancient world, as it has also come down to us and is practiced, baptism is an indication that a person is leaving behind a way of life, their old life, and they are entering into a new life. And this is exactly what a believer does. We are described by the Apostle Paul as having been dead in our trespasses and sins, but made alive through Christ. And so it is indeed a excellent picture of being buried in a watery grave, but then raised up to go and to live a brand new life, identifying with Christ and with his body, the church. Question number two relating to that, why was Jesus baptized? He was our great example. Matthew chapter three, and verses 13 to 17 give us the description of Jesus' baptism. And you find this at the outset of each of the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But here, Matthew says, Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John, that is John the Baptist, to be baptized by him. John, he is described as being rather horrified at the thought of baptizing the Son of God, the Lamb of God, John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus answered him, permit it at this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he permitted him. Jesus he was not a sinner who needed his sins pictured as being washed away, but he was fulfilling all righteousness. That is, he was doing the right thing in the Father's eyes by coming and offering himself, being our example in this way, and so that we might follow after him. That is why Jesus himself was baptized, not that he was a sinner, but that he was giving us the example for us to follow. Question number three, is it a sin to enjoy things God gave you? Let me preface my answer to this in the gentlest way of saying, the, perhaps the questioner is assuming that God is a bit of a killjoy and that God is looking to uh, to, to ruin your life, or at least to withhold that which is pleasurable from you. By no means. I take you to two portions of Scripture, the first of them being 1 Timothy chapter 6, and 17, verses 17 to 19, and then we'll come to James chapter 1. In to Timothy, the Apostle Paul said, instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. God is the one who provides us that which gives genuine enjoyment. And so if he has given you something, there is nothing wrong with that that you enjoy it. And Paul, Paul continues, instruct them to be good, to, do, to, to be rich in good works, to be generous, ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation. Paul is saying that we should enjoy these things which have been given to us by God, but that our heart should not be set or fixed upon them. Then James chapter 1 and verse 17, every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above. That is where these things come from. They are from our Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. 
Thank you for these questions. If you have a question, send it to us. We will use it as we are able. Faith to live by, Box 426, Winnipeg, Manitoba, R3C2H6. The Women's Trio now, No One Understands Like Jesus, and that is followed by Matt Bowring, All Your Anxiety.
Every believer in Jesus Christ delights in the great truths which the Apostle Paul penned to the Romans. In Romans, the 16 chapters, there are precious truths such as there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. My father, Dr. Barber, preached 16 sermons, one from each of the chapters in Romans, and produced this book, which we have sent out hundreds and hundreds of copies. We are once again reminding you of its availability, and along with the re-release, we are also offering this CD, which is a scripture reading of the text of Romans from the King James Version by myself. You may have both of them or one or other of them at your request, and do write to us at Faith to Live By, Box 426, Winnipeg, Manitoba, R3C2H6. You may also contact us toll-free at 1-833-367-3867. Our website, Faith to Live By, also has a means of you being in touch with us. And now we have once again the male quartet to sing, Oh, What a Savior! Once I was Inside. 
As the Old Testament book of First Chronicles comes to a conclusion, David the king is laid to rest and Solomon is the new king. It was in David's heart to build a temple in Jerusalem for the name of his God. But God said, no, David, it was good that you had that desire, but it will not be for you. It will be for your son. David does everything that he possibly can to prepare the way and to assemble the resources that Solomon might proceed with haste and that it might be done. Solomon comes to the throne and begins the great task of building the temple there in Jerusalem. And the day comes when the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord is brought in to the temple and the dedication takes place. The glory of God so fills the temple that the priests are unable to stand and to minister. And Solomon prays a great prayer there in Jerusalem before the people. And God comes and responds to Solomon in a night vision. I think you will be acquainted with these words. Second Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14. God speaks to Solomon, If my people who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin and will heal their land. This word that comes to us from 3000 years ago is most applicable to our land. Indeed, Canada needs healing, and we live in the midst of nations all round about us who need the power of God, who need the touch of God, who need a quickening of God's Spirit within our land. Right from the top to the bottom, there is a groaning in our land that God might be praised, that God might be exalted, and that there might be His power to address the problems which are immediately before us. God lays out the recipe for when there is trouble in the land and how it is appropriately dealt with. God comes to Solomon in this night dream, in, the, in this vision, and he says, my people, believers in Jesus Christ, need to gather and we need to be crying out to the Lord we need to humble ourselves, and the way that we do that is to declare that we are beyond our abilities. We are unable to handle the task by ourselves. We need Almighty God to come amongst us once again and to do what only He does so very well. If my people, God is speaking to believers, he is speaking to those who are intimate with his ways, those who are acquainted with his word. If my people, the people who rejoice in the Lord God, if my people who bear my name, those who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray. We get down on our knees and we say, O oh God, that you would show your power, that you would show your strength, that there might be something that is unexplainable in any other way except that you have arisen in power and that you are acting on our behalf. If my people which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, I mean pray, not just tip our hat, not just salute the Lord and then go merrily on our way to do our own thing, but to hunker down and to pray and to seek God's face as he says here, that was an expression of earnestness seeking the face of God, not being content with just brushing by or getting somewhat in the proximity of God, but seeking the face of God, seeking the face of God. 
God makes a declaration. If these things take place, combined with people setting aside that which is displeasing to the Lord, wickedness must be put aside. There must be no closet or corner which is yet unsurrendered, not yielded to the Lord. Seeking God's face and seeking his holiness and that that holiness might be a part of us as well. God then says, I will hear. I will no longer turn a deaf ear to what the cry of the people are. We remember down in Egypt when the people groaned under the burden of Pharaoh. God heard the cry of those people. God was not insensitive to their cry. And here once again in the time of Solomon and in our day as well, God says, I will hear and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Oh, dear friend, I call upon you to join together and to make 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 14, a rallying cry that we would call upon God, that we would seek his face, that those things which in any sense, in any way are displeasing to the Lord, that they be put aside and that we say, Lord, work in our hearts and work in our cities, our provinces, our nation, work in our world that you might be glorified. He'll do it and he'll be praised. There's still room for one. Yes, there's room at the cross. Thank you for joining Pastor Barber today. Please watch for Faith to Live By again next Sunday at this same time on this same station. Until then, Faith to Live By prays that the peace of God will fill your heart and that the joy of the Lord will be your strength. Pastor Barber would love to hear from you. The mailing address is Faith to Live By, Box 426, Winnipeg, Manitoba, R3C2H6. 